that, is it okay if I just go into the word of the Lord? Amen. I want to go right into the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And uh, scripture that we, most of us know. It's about 4 in the morning for me. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And the Bible reads as so in the name of Jesus Christ. But you shall receive power. Somebody say power. Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And to the end of the earth. I just simply want to speak to you the next three hours on this subject. Why do you laugh? Amen. Uncommon power for a common people. Uncommon power for a common people. Somebody say, I'm common. Amen. Well, God has given uncommon power to common people. Father, we thank you for your privilege that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. And I pray, oh God, that you would anoint my lips, that I may speak according to the oracles of God as an oracle of God. May this be a blessed time in the Lord. And may you uh, witness to this and uh, confirm with signs following. In Jesus' name. We pray, amen and amen. God bless you all. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. In the realm of Christianity, we firmly believe and embrace a supernatural world. When I say a supernatural world, we uh, base that belief. It is rooted in that beyond the confines of this material world, there exists a spiritual realm. To be a true believer is to acknowledge that reality, the reality of the supernatural. And if you have a problem with the supernatural, then you'll have a problem with God because the Bible says in John 4, 24, that God is a spirit. And when we speak of God as a spirit, we are spe speaking of his divine and immaterial nature that transcends the boundaries of the physical world. God has no form. God is not visible to the human eye. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. So if you believe in God, by default, you believe in a supernatural world. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the world was not formed through meticulous scientific calculations and complex architectural processes. No, baby, the world was created and is still sustained by the word of God's supernatural power. Hallelujah. God is not relying on some mystical external force for his power. He, but his power is simply an expression of who he is at his core. Listen, when you're that powerful, you do all things according to the counsel of your own good. You don't need a committee. You don't need a governing board. You don't need meetings with minutes and resolutions. God will do what he wants to do when he wants to do it and how he wants to do it. God is God. God doesn't increase in power and God doesn't diminish in power over time. He has always been. He is now and he will always be all powerful. He just is by virtue of who he is by virtue of his essence he is all 
powerful. The Bible tells you so. Psalm 62 verse 11. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. God. Jeremiah 32 and 17. Nothing is too hard for you. Luke 1 and 37. For with God nothing is impossible. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19. It talks about the immeasurable greatness of the power of God. And if that's not enough for you, the old songwriter used to sing, what a mighty God we serve angels bow before him heaven and earth adore him what a mighty God we serve bless the name of the Lord amen how powerful is this God I'm talking to you about well the son is an outstanding example of immense power in the natural world and to put it into perspective the the son's power generates energy at a rate of approximately 386 billion billion megawatts that sounds like my bank account three hundred and eighty six billion billion megawatts that is an unimaginable amount of power if the sun's energy could be harnessed for just one second it could power the entire world for billions of years if one were to try to match the amount of power that is contained in the sun you would have to detonate 100 trillion tons of dynamite every single second of every minute of every day now these facts highlight the incredible power that is found in our sun in the context of this universe however I'm here to preach to you that for all the sun's radiant energy I'm here to declare that the sun's power is no match for the power of God you see, that explosive ball of energy is a mere creation of God's spoken word. He called it into existence by his divine command. He said on the fourth day of creation, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And boom, 386 billion, billion megawatts watts uh, were spoken into existence uh, by the power of God's word. Uh, you know what that tells me? Uh, if the power of the sun uh, is outstanding, uh, imagine uh, the boundless power of the one uh, who simply spoke it into existence. Our God, uh, that's how powerful your God is. Uh, he's so powerful. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, he's so powerful. He owns every beast of the forest. Uh, knows them by name. Uh, he's so powerful. Isaiah said he measures uh, the sea uh, with the palm uh, of his hand. Uh, he determines uh, the number of the stars uh, and he gives to all of them uh, their names. Uh, the Bible tells me uh, he knows the end uh, from the beginning uh, he knows the hair that is on your head uh, he weighs the mountains uh, on a scale he laid the earth's foundation uh, he walks uh, on the recesses of the deep uh, your God is a powerful God here tonight now it's no secret that when God purposes to work in the human realm, he uses humans to conduct or to bring about the fruition of his plans. You can't deal with that kind of power. The kind of power that speaks the sun into existence cannot show forth his raw power or you would immediately die. 
I think sometimes we don't understand what the Bible means when it says that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. When God wants to bring about his power into this world, he brings about his power through flesh. See, Jesus was not 50% God and 50% human. Jesus was fully human and fully divine and fully human and fully divine. He wasn't divine flesh walking among us. No. The Gnostics believed that in the day of John. So John had to remind them and say, hey Gnostics, that's not no, you know, that, that that's not a, a ghost that you're watching just uh, uh, roaming around the earth. No. That which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon our hands have handled concerning the word of life God was really flesh just like you and I he was all human he experienced hunger he thirsted he grew weary he wept and cried he sighed and groaned and glared angrily he felt annoyance he also also had a true immaterial soul. He said, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. It was into the Father's hands that he committed his spirit. He was a real human like you and I. We read often of a genuinely human emotional life. He felt compassion and anger and joy. The point is, Jesus was all human. But someone is going to say, well, but yeah, I know he was human, but he was also God. Yes, he was. However, Philippians 2 tells us that though he was in the form of God, he did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputa reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient uh, to the point of death, uh, even the death of a cross. What, what does that even mean? It means that when Jesus came to this earth, uh, he emptied himself. Uh, he humbled himself uh, by becoming a man. Uh, grasp this. Uh, he never ceased to be God. However, in becoming a man, God voluntarily chose to limit the independent exercise of his divine attributes uh, fully living within human limitations uh, while remaining fully divine. What, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you what that means. Because many times we say, well, as a man, he drank water. And as God, he walked on waters. Let, let me tell you something. That's not how Jesus walked on water. He walked on water not as God. He walked on water as a man. Well, you're going to tell me, well, that's not even possible. Well, God, let me ask you this. How did Peter walk on water? He didn't turn water into wine as God. He did all that he did as a man. Even the forgiveness of sins, which belongs strictly to God. But listen to what he says. The son of man has authority to forgive sins. There was an authority that was given to him from heaven for these matters. But everything that he did and accomplished, he did it as a man. So I know somebody's going to say if he emptied himself of his divine attributes, how is he able to live a sinless life, discern thoughts and intentions of the heart, foretell events, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Last time I checked, a human being can't do those things. Well, I am so thankful that you asked that question. And here goes your answer. Jesus had a total reliance on the power of the Holy Ghost for everything that he did. 
that same power that created the sun and set the foundations of the earth in the supernatural is the same power that anointed the very human Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to ask, well, where do you see that? Listen to what Peter says in his sermon to Cornelius. He said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And so he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. He didn't walk on water as God. He walked on water because the Holy Holy Spirit uh, took him by the hand uh, and said, come on, uh, come on, uh, this is your turn, uh, this is your time, uh, I'm going to put my power in you uh, so that the people will see how awesome uh, and how powerful your God is. From his inception all the way to his ascension, Jesus Christ was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't understand how deeply the Holy Spirit was involved in the life of this human being called Jesus, the captain of our salvation, who was made like one of us. Listen, at the conception of Jesus in the womb, how did that ever happen? I'll tell you how it happened. There, the Holy Spirit was there, even at his conception. Here goes Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follow. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now you go down to two verses later, Matthew 1 and 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, this is Joseph. He's thinking about these things, and he's like, well, she's got, she's got two or three sides, and I'm, I'm not going to deal with that right now. And this is what the angel, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Then you go down to Luke 135, and the angel answered, and now this is the angel talking to Mary, and he answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, because she said, how can this be? I don't know a man. And he said, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So there you go. At his conception, the Holy Spirit was there. We don't know much about his childhood and his youth, but all we know in Luke 2.40, and the child grew and became strong in spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him and then you go all the way down to the beginning at his baptism what happened there go to John 1 32 and it will tell you what happened and John bore witness saying I saw the spirit descending from the heaven like a dove and he remained upon him in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit would come would anoint and then leave but the sign of the true son of God it is not just that the Holy Spirit came and anointed this Jesus of Nazareth he remained upon him it was a permanent anointing therefore he is named the Christ the anointed one but then right after his baptism what happens Mark 1 and 12 immediately right after he is baptized immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness Luke chapter 4 and verse 1 then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan he had just been baptized he returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness well there he goes he's fasting 40 days and 40 nights how does he come out from from his temptation from the desert he was led into it by the spirit how does he come out of it I'm glad you asked you go to Luke 4 and 14 then Jesus returned in the power of 
the Spirit to Galilee and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. He comes out of the desert and the first thing he does after he comes out of the 40 days, he goes over to the temple. Well, guess what happens when he goes into the synagogue at the very beginning of his public ministry? He opens up the book and guess what he reads on the very first day? He reads the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. You still don't believe me? Now, during his ministry, he's at his conception. He's at his childhood. He's at his baptism. He's at the beginning of his ministry. Leads him to the desert. Brings him out of the desert. There's the Holy Spirit. Brings him out of the desert. He goes into the synagogue. The Spirit is upon me during his ministry. Luke 12 and 28. But if I cast out demons by what? By the Spirit of God. God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. He said, I cast them out by the spirit of God, even at his death. How did he stay up on that cross as a man? Nobody is courageous enough to stay up on that cross. But listen to what it says, Hebrews 9 and 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot? to God. It was through the spirit that he offered himself up without spot to God. It's the spirit that was with him and said, I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. Come on. I'm going to empower you. How do you need help? I'm right here. You're, I'm right here. You're going to have power. How did he come out of that tomb? I'm so glad you asked. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. After three days, this is what it says. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He led them to the cross. He brings them out of the tomb. The spirit is with him all throughout his life. And now, we get 40 days after the Passover. 40 days after the Passover. Here comes his ascension. And it's time to leave this world. What are the last words that come out of his mouth? See, last words are very important. Last words normally would tell you what is on somebody's mind. What characterizes his life for the whole process of his life. These were the last words of Jesus before he ascends into heaven. Are you ready for this? But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. It's the last thing on his mind as he is being ascended into heaven. He says, you are going to receive power. It's like he was saying, I'm leaving, but my work is not finished. Now you are the new body of Christ here on earth, but I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. I'm not going to leave you without power. I'm not going to leave you without somebody, an advocate, a helper, a counselor. I'm not going to leave you without resources or tools. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit descends upon you. It's the same spirit and it's the same power that was with me at my conception, at my birth, at my childhood, in my baptism, at my temptation, when I talked in the temple 
when I cast out demons, when I heal the sick, even in my death, and now my resurrection, it's the spirit that was leading me the whole time, and now I give it to you. It's your turn. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost Go to Jerusalem. I'm about to pour it upon you. Whatever was on me is going to be the same thing that's on you. It's the same spirit that will quicken your mortal body someday through the Holy Spirit. You know what was the first thing Jesus did? As soon as he rose from the dead. The first thing Jesus did immediately after his resurrection from the dead a meeting with his followers he goes in through the door and this is what he does. <laughs> he doesn't say hi. He doesn't say what's up. Walks in and goes <laughs> receive ye the spirit. As I have been sent, so send I you. It's the very first thing he did. It's almost... It's almost like he's passing the baton and he's saying, this was my secret. This was my secret. I've been promising it to you. I told you there's something coming. It's a promise from the father. Remember, I kept telling you there's something coming. It's a promise for, from the father. It's going to give you power. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the, the comforter and he's going to come and he's going to be with you. This is what he's been saying. This is what he's been promising. This is what he's been telling them. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm sending a, a comforter. This is what it is. He said, I'm going to send the, the paracletos. The paracletos. He's going to be there. He's going to take you by the hand just like he did me. That's what's going to happen with you. And he's going to come to your side. You know what that comforter means? It means para, which means beside or alongside and then kaleo it's the same it's the two combination word para and kaleo kaleo means to call you know what he was saying whoever was called to walk by my side that's exactly what I am commanding to come and help you and to walk by your side Whoever it was that took me by the hand when I was conceived, when I was birthed, even in my childhood, even in my baptism, in the desert, in my ministry, at the synagogue, as I cast out devils, in my death, in my resurrection, now I'm here to tell you that same spirit that dwelt in me dwells in you, and now it's your turn. Now, why did he do this? Why did they need the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus' mission was not finished. It simply moved into a new phase. And now Jesus continues the mission his father gave him by sending his disciples with the same power with which the father had sent him. And at Pentecost, the operation of the Holy Ghost did not end. It didn't end at Pentecost. Because many people feel like the Holy Ghost is goosebumps on Sunday morning. It's not, that's not what it was. He said, you shall receive power. You shall receive power. It's not what you feel. The power is not to help you feel something. The power is to help you do something. You shall receive power. Now, they said, well, is that right? We're going to need power? Okay. Then here they go. They start getting persecuted. The first church starts getting persecuted. And I love this because in the middle of a persecution, in the midst of a persecution, they did not ask, oh, God, free us from this person. That's what 
us in first world countries would have asked for. Oh, Lord, look at the poor refugees and look at the persecution of the church in such and such a country and, and look what they're doing. And so, do, do you not understand that we need persecution? Woof. I'm going to get many amens here tonight. But I, I, I'm, I'm in the word, but I don't have time to go into that. But listen, listen to this. Here it goes. They prayed not for deliverance, not for favor with the governors and the king. Do you know what they prayed for in the midst of a persecution? This is what they prayed. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Lord, the more they persecute us, the more we need boldness to continue to speak your word. And this is also what we want. Don't just give us boldness to preach, but confirm your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And guess what happened when they prayed that prayer? You know what happened? And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And watch this. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Whew. And now they said, well, you know what? This Holy Ghost thing, we need this Holy Ghost thing to do the work of God in this world. This is, a, this is an evil world and perverse time that we're living in, and we need the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, they said, you know what? As a matter of fact, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to need some people because we got a little gossip going on in the church now. And so the Greek widows are mad because the Hebrew widows are getting fed but they're not so we're going to need somebody to feed these women a little beef stew is there anybody available for that so he said as a matter of fact you guys choose among yourselves seven men and you know what the qualifications were to serve beef stew in the first church here it goes these were the qualifications brethren seek out from among you seven men of good reputation watch this full of the Holy Ghost. I don't just want anybody serving beef stew. I don't just want anybody giving these widows a, a little ministry. You're going to be out here serving tables. I'm going to need you to be full with the Holy Ghost. I'm coming here to teach and to preach to some ushers in this house. I know you're just a greeter. I know you're just on the tech team. I know all you do is carry a video, but you ought to seek to be filled with the Holy Ghost because this is how God is operating in this season and in this age and in this time he said you shall receive power to do the work of a ministry And now everything they did, the Holy Ghost speaks to Peter, Acts 10 and 19. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. The Spirit never spoke to Peter before Jesus left. Uh-uh. When he said, you shall receive power, all of a sudden, everything the first church does now is through the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit gives directions to the leaders. You know how the leaders picked Barnabas and Paul to be sent out as missionaries? They didn't just sit there and go, well, who's Who's, who's the most talented among us? Who, 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 who's, uh, who's got a little more education and, and diversity that can go down to the, you know, we don't, we, we, not us. You know, we, 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 we circumcised out here. Who, who's, who, who's, who, who them? And that's not the way they did it. You know the way they did it? In Acts chapter 13, the Bible said, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, 
Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. When? When the Holy Spirit spake. Then it was the Spirit that forbade Paul and Timothy to preach in Asia. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. That's Acts chapter 16 and 6. They were filled with the Spirit and then they prophesied. The Samaritans came over, got rebaptized, and then they were filled with the Spirit. And not only were they filled with the Spirit, now they're prophesying. So the Spirit is in operation all throughout the first church. But here is the whole point to my whole sermon. This Holy Spirit was not just for prophets and apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers and missionaries. This Holy Spirit was for the common folk. It was given power to common people. And now you have people coming out the woodwork that you've never heard of before. I mean, people you've never heard of before. Stephen, for example, who was selected to serve precisely because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And so they said, okay, come, come on, get, give a little oatmeal to the widows. Well, this man was out here giving oatmeal to the widows. Two verses after that, in verse 8 in chapter 6 of the book of Acts, listen to what happens to Stephen. All, all he was was a dude feeding the widows, but he was filled with the Spirit. And in Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, listen to this. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Who? Some dude that got up and said, would, would you like uh, flour or corn tortillas? I, I can I almost picture it. The lady said, well... I don't know. You know, it's been, it's been messing with my stomach of late. I don't know. And here's Stephen. Oh, it has it really? Well, guess what? I got the Holy Ghost down in my soul, just like the Bible said. Well, why don't I lay hands on you? And I heard somewhere that Jesus said, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so he did signs and wonders among the people. This was not an evangelist. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a preacher. He was just out serving tables. But he did signs and wonders because he was full of faith and power and did many any signs and wonders among the people. There was another guy who was also there serving tables. Same deal. He was cho As a matter of fact, the apostles didn't even choose these men. It wasn't like the apostles saw a little. They said, oh, look at that guy. He's got a little potential. Come on. No, that's not what happened. The apostles said to the church, they said, choose ye among yourselves seven men. You choose seven men among yourselves. It was the people. The people looked around and said, all right, who's filled with the Holy Spirit here? around here. Hey, you, you, Philip, come on. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on. Well, Philip came up and all he was doing was giving the widows a little something to eat. Well, this is what happened on the next day. This is Acts 21, 8 and 9. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist. He started out serving tables and all of a sudden filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said he becomes an evangelist who was one of the seven and
and stayed with him. Now watch this. Not only was he filled with the Spirit, doing great signs and wonders and preaching the words of God, the word of God, but the Lord said, this promise is not just unto you, but it's also unto your children. And so, hey, Philip, come on. I know you're not a big somebody. I know you don't. You never went to Bible school. I know you're not a son of a preacher. I know you were born on the wrong side of the tracks. But come on, Philip. I'm not just going to anoint you. But watch this. Now this man had four virgin daughters who also prophesied. Common folk. Here's the deal. We've all heard of Paul, right? Saul turned into Paul. He wasn't just an apostle. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. He wasn't just, no one ever witnessed to him. The Lord himself wins him over in a personal interview. This is, this is the apostle, the apostle. He wasn't, he, was just, he wasn't just anybody. He's the only guy who ever has a vision of the third heaven. He goes into the third heaven and has a vision. Writes more than half of the New Testament. Has the equivalent of at least two PhDs by the time he's 25 years old. This is the apostle. Plants close to 20 churches. The apostle Paul, right? You've all heard of him. Well, it always amuses me. Who's the dude that anointed him to be an apostle. He's not part of the 12. He wasn't an apostle and evangelist. He wasn't a teacher. All the Bible says about this guy named Ananias is found in Acts 22 and 12. And all it says is this. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. That's all we know about Ananias. He was some devout man that lived according to the laws and had a good testimony among the Jews where he lived. Well, watch this. Ananias, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 17, listen to what it says. And Ananias went his way and entered the house this is after the Holy Ghost gives him a vision and talks to him. He enters into a house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Who? He didn't ask the district super. Right? This Ananias guy, out of nowhere, anoints the apostle to the Gentiles to be an apostle and a minister. Just walks in, lays hands on him and said, the Holy Ghost brought me to lay hands on you and you are now the apostle to the Gentiles. And then the audacity. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 4, I, I just, I love this one. This is what it says. And finding disciples, this is Paul. Now he's no longer Saul. This is Paul, the apostle. In Acts chapter 21, and finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul, this is, again, these are just common disciples, just people in the church that just show up on Sundays, late. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They, they found them. They didn't, they didn't even mention them by name. They just, they found, they said, you got a skirt on? Hey, girl, you, you, you one of us. We stayed there seven days. And they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Just main people, common people, told the Apostle Paul, hey, by the way, 
the Holy Ghost just told us that you should not go up to Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul, who was probably in their attic sleeping, watching the Lord in the third heaven, and just come down from that, and then these three guys eating Spam Musubi looked over and said, oh, by the way, the Holy Ghost just told us don't go up to Jerusalem. Thank you. And what was the common denominator? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. That's it. That was all. Last year, towards the beginning of the year, I was, uh, uh, I was at the church, and uh, I, I hardly knew anybody. I had just been pastoring a year, and people started showing up, and honestly, I didn't even know who they were. And um, every service, it was like, I've never seen you before. Uh, could you be a deacon? But <laughs> that's basically, that's where we're at. And um, I was sitting in, there was a, a guy in his family. He had been coming for, uh, you know, several weeks, maybe a, maybe a couple months by that time. And I, I hardly knew who this guy was. We were I was sitting in the audience. I had had, a, I was going through something in about three weeks, and y'all, I need to let you know, I don't get, I hardly ever get sick. I mean, the Lord has blessed me that way. I just, that's just the way I, I, I operate. I, I haven't been to the doctor in decades. Maybe I should go one day. Um, I just got back from Japan. I think I'm going to go. So I, I, I was over, and uh, my foot, out of nowhere, my foot started hurting like you would not believe, my, my left foot. I didn't know what was going on. It got, uh, it was swollen like a watermelon. Basically, I, there were at least two nights where I kid you not, and I hate to admit this in public, I cried. I cried. That's how painful it was. All night long, it was throbbing. It, was, it felt like someone kept stabbing my foot. I tried everything. I'm now pastoring a predominantly Mexican church, and they gave me every home remedy from every warlock back in their back in their little country, you know, in their place. And, uh, and so I, I listened, I tried, we put all sorts of stuff, I, uh, every remedy, every stuff. I ate some nasty stuff. I, I had a guy uh, who said that if I were to put a cactus leaf on my foot, he said, that thing, it works wonder. It made it worse. It was just... It, 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 it was horrible. I, nothing could help me. I had a couple of engagements. I did not cancel them by the grace of God, but I um, was forced to wear Crocs as I preached. That's So I'd, I'd wear Crocs as I preached. Um, w one Croc. It was one Croc on my left foot. Um, I, I still believe in holiness. And so I... <laughs> <laughs> Holiness is right. Crocs are left. So I, I wore the, the croc. It, 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 it was awful. Uh, in the service that Sunday, um, I, I just limped in. I was supposed to go to the doctor. Well, I went to the doctor uh, that week. Uh, the doctor uh, pulled some stuff, and he said, listen, I have no idea what it is. I see something. Your foot is obviously swollen but it's too swollen for us to see anything. So you're gonna have to come back next week. And he gave me a, a long list of possibilities. And uh, come back next week, once we get the, uh, the swelling uh, down, then, then we might be able to, to see something. Well, uh, gave me medicine, told me what all I was supposed to do. I tried everything, it still did not work. 
up on that Sunday, I was, I was sitting up over in the front. I had my, uh, croc, my Crocs on and uh, limping the whole time. The Holy Spirit began to move in that service. The singers began to sing the song, A Miracle Can Happen. A miracle can happen in this place. There's this one brother, he's a gypsy, so you know you can't trust him. He was, he's coming over down this guy I'm telling you about. We, I know him now because uh, he's one of our ministers now, but at the time I had no idea who this guy was. His name is Brother Ricardo. He comes from the fourth row, and he comes over, and he whispers in my ear, and he said, Pastor, he said, I just felt from the Holy Ghost right now that I am to lay hands on you and you will be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I looked at this man and my first reaction was, bless his heart. Bless his heart. But you know, I'm, I'm the pastor and I, I wanted his tithe. So I said, amen, let's... <laughs> Y'all ain't ready for this kind of transparency. I said, amen. I said, amen, sir. I said, I, I, I believe it with you. Amen. Y'all, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt this was not going to work. Um, raised my hand, and he had, his, his prayer wasn't even anointed. Well, yeah, he didn't, he never shook me like he didn't he didn't nothing. He didn't pull my hair. I I was I was expecting something, nothing. All he did was he said, "Father, you know why you brought me here, and and why you whispered this in my ear." So I pray for my pastor right now, and all I could think of was, "I'm your pastor." Tithe. I said, amen, Lord, thank you. He prayed over me, and he said, in Jesus' name. And I said, amen, thank you, brother, thank you, brother. And uh, it was my turn to go up, and I began to preach. Um, as I was preaching, the Holy Ghost began to move. And all I remember was, I'm preaching, and, you know, I've got my Crocs on. Don't bother me. I got my Crocs on, I'm preaching. But all of a sudden, I am running on the platform. And I had not even realized what was happening to me until I realized what was happening to me. And I just, I looked over and I began to cry and I said, I don't know what just happened. But I feel like the Lord just touched my foot because I can't feel the pain anymore. And from that day, no swelling, no pain, no doctor, no anything. God operated through the power of the Holy Spirit that was placed in just a random common guy who came over and stepped out in faith and said, Pastor, I feel it in the Holy Ghost right now that I'm going to lay hands on you and you will be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. You know who I'm preaching to here on this first night? I'm preaching to somebody who comes up every single week. I can't teach a Bible study. I can't do this. I'm just not good enough. I'm just not, I'm just not skilled enough. I just don't know. I'm not here. I'm... Do you even realize what kind of spirit is the one that has infilled you? It's the same spirit that rose up Christ Jesus from the dead. Do you? 
I, y'all, y'all, y'all don't even understand what I'm talking about. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. There's no more hope after death. And yet it's that same spirit that swallowed up death in victory and said, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The dead, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory. I'm telling you, in this house, that Holy Spirit is the same one that dwells in you. Would you lift your hands all over this building right now? Lift your hands all over this building right now. And I want you to say, Lord, if I have this Holy Ghost, would you use me for your glory? I wonder if there are some common people, just common folk in this house that want to be used by the Holy Ghost in this place. I feel many times that you don't realize what's even abiding in you, what is in you. We're so scared of of testifying. We sit on a plane and put our headphones on because we're shy and we don't realize it's not a personality thing. God is not here to use personalities. God is not here to use talent. God is, as a matter of fact, the more common you are, the more you give him a chance for his glory to shine. It is in your weakness that his strength is made perfect. That's what it is. And so there are some people in here you don't even, oh, I've got the Holy Ghost. What do you do with it? Well, I just feel good every so often. That's not what the Holy Ghost is for. You not get what the Holy Ghost is for? The Holy Ghost has come. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost falls upon you. There's a power that you need, and it goes beyond talent. I'm telling you, there are some people that can that 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 will sing you to death. Sing better than Mariah Carey. Well, the young Mariah Carey. (laughs) But can't move a thing. Because they haven't been anointed by the Holy Spirit to do what they do and then there's people that all they do is serve tables by the power of the Holy Ghost many signs and wonders are done among the people through their hands you know why because they have a complete reliance just as Jesus did on the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm here to preach to this conference that there are common people in this house right now all over this house common folk who are going, man, all all I am is just a used car salesman. That's all I am. I'm just a teacher. I'm just an administrative assistant. I just, that's, I'm a barista over at Starbucks. That's all. I I don't know. I've never, I've never really done much other than just that. But the Holy Ghost is anointing you just as he anointed Jesus of Nazareth. And so tonight, what my assignment here is to figuratively blow on you like Jesus did his disciples. <sighs> Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Just as Jesus was sent, now I send you. You can have revival in your home. You have revival in your city you can win your family to Christ you can overcome your temptation you can walk in the spirit and not satisfy the lusts of the flesh you can open up your Bible and the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth you can make more much of Jesus you can by the power of the Holy Spirit Lift your hands all over this house and lift your voices all over this house right now. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voices all over this house. Father, we still believe that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so I pray here tonight, oh God, that you would help us 
Lord, bring the Holy Spirit inside of us and through us and help us, oh Lord, to minister one to another. Lord, I pray that you would confirm this word through signs, miracles, and wonders that are going to be done even in this house tonight. We don't have to wait till the last day, but even in this first night of turning point, I pray, oh Lord, that your Holy Ghost would be upon your people. Lord, that the gifts of the Spirit would be loosed in this house. Lord, I pray over common people, shy people, embarrassed folks, folks who don't live on the right side of town. I, I pray for just some common folk, oh God, who didn't come from the best domestic background. Father, but I pray even now for somebody who's been abused all of their lives and they don't even know the kind of power that they have been anointed with. The same power that anointed Jesus of Nazareth and brought him out of the grave is the same power that abides in them. I'm praying even for tone deaf people in this house that you're going to anoint to sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm praying for some people in this house right now that you are gearing up to make them a pastor and a soul winner and a church planner and an evangelist somewhere. And all they're doing is serving and all they're doing is just out feeding the widows. But I pray even now that the Holy Ghost would anoint some common people in this house is there anybody in the holy ghost that you want the holy ghost to move in you in that powerful way i'm going to open this altar up right now come on i need some people to come to this altar right now and say holy ghost i'm just a common folk i'm the, my parents ain't anything i don't know i don't come from i don't come from pentecostal royalty it's just me i don't know what i'm doing i don't know what i say sometimes but would you anoint me with the same holy ghost with which you anointed jesus of nazareth that i may lay hands on the sick and they shall recover father we're hungry for a supernatural work of the holy ghost in this house we are hungry we are hungry we want to see your power we want to see miracle signs and wonders we're hungry oh lord to see the supernatural even as we witness oh, there's a hundred soul revival in somebody's high school come on young people because you've been filled with the holy ghost i know you're common i know you've been bullied i know i know but God chose the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. God chose the base things of the world to bring to naught the things that are. Come on. You don't have just anything. I'm talking to you about the power of the Holy Ghost that's in this house. Whoa. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Is there anybody in this house that has a great need? Would you lift your hands? You have a great need. And I'm not talking about just, you know, the random day-to-day -day stuff. I'm talking about you need God to intervene. Whether that's health, whether that's a social thing, whether whatever that is. You need God to intervene. Would you lift your hand if that's where you are right now? You need God to intervene. I need everybody to open up your eyes, wherever you are. I need you to open up your eyes, and I need you to see who's around you who has lifted up their hands right now, with their hands lifted up. And now I'm going to ask this church all over this building, if you feel led in the Holy Ghost, if you have the Holy Ghost and you feel led in the Holy Ghost, 
and please follow whatever the appropriate protocol is from your individual pastor that he has established in his church but whatever that protocol is however you want to pray with somebody would you please be led of the Holy Ghost even now and come and pray with somebody as you are led I want to see signs miracles and wonders in this house and if we truly believe what we've been preaching that the Holy Ghost said that God, Jesus said that we will have power after that the Holy Ghost would fall upon us then this is what we're going to exercise on this first night of this conference here I believe that there is some sick people in this house that are going to be healed I'm, I'm believing God for some miracles and I'm not I'm not hearing anybody in this house I need somebody's faith to rise in this house believing that God is able to use a common individual with uncommon power is there anybody in this house that believes that now I want you to go if you are filled with the Holy Ghost you are a praying individual who are filled with the Holy Ghost I need you to go to somebody who had their hands lifted up and I need you to pray over them in the name of Jesus Christ I need somebody to pray with somebody in this house all over this building find somebody you can pray with amen put your hands on their back put your hands on their shoulder find somebody that you can pray with find somebody and in the name of Jesus believing that whatever you have, you're going to exercise that gift. Even now in the name of Jesus. Come on. Exercise that gift by the power of the Holy Ghost that is in this house. I loose whatever it is. Whatever gift that is dwelling in you. To operate within this meeting. Even now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I want to hear the testimonies of your great work that we may all corporately rejoice. That we may all corporately rejoice. That it may be a sign, oh God. That it may be a witness to those who still don't know you. By the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Go as you're led. Pray with somebody. As you're led. I know you're coming. You've got an uncommon power. I know we're common in this house, but we've got an uncommon power. The same power that spoke the earth into existence. It